Let's begin with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you are amazing and true. Your love is overwhelming. We praise you for your grace. We praise you for your love. We thank you that you're faithful. And Lord, we just want to exalt you today and praise you because you're our creator and God. We praise you and worship you today because you sent your son, the Lord Jesus. You have filled us with your spirit. You have provided us a home in heaven. And Lord, we worship you for that. Lord, teach us. Teach us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, in science, if you ask, what is the strongest force in the universe, you will be told about the four forces. Electromagnetic, gravity, weak nuclear force, and strong nuclear force. And the strongest of these four is called the strong nuclear force. And what that means is that in the atom... Uh, You have these, if you have more than one proton, protons are positive charged. And you know that if you have a positive negative, they attract like a magnet. But if you have two positives, what do they do? They repel. Well, if you have more than one proton in the nucleus of an atom, of course, they're going to repel. And it's the strong nuclear force that keeps it together, that keeps the atom together so it doesn't fly apart. And that's a good thing, or we see a lot of things flying apart. And that's considered the strongest force in the universe, according to scientists. Now, in the universe, one of the most powerful events is called the gamma ray burst, or these hypernovas. These, it's not a supernova, it's a hypernova. And this happens when a sun, similar, uh, about 150 times larger than our sun, collapses in on itself and basically explodes. And when this explosion takes place, it will produce as much energy in a few seconds what our sun will produce in, in 10 billion years. <laughs> in just a few seconds, that's the amount of energy. It's an explosion that's equivalent to 10 trillion, trillion, billion megaton bombs. I mean, it's, it's a lot of energy. Now, interesting, uh, these gamma ray bursts, or these hypernovas, if you will, they, they discovered them when, during the Cold War when they would put satellites to check on Russia's nuclear arsenal. And they would be looking for these minor, you know, these gamma ray bursts. And, but, of course, they turned the satellites into space, and they saw these massive ones taking place. When you think of the word power, both strong nuclear force and the gamma ray burst tend to define that word. When you think of the word control, oppression, force, or coercion, sometimes we use those words to define power. If you look at the kings of the Old Testament, particularly David, Solomon, Tiglath, Pileser, Nebuchadnezzar, Cyrus, Xerxes, Artaxerxes, you can see that they were powerful men. The kingdom of Nebuchadnezzar and the Persian kings were pictures of invincibility. They were untouchable. Their kingdoms were vast. Their power unequaled. Their armies innumerable and their weapons unmatched. They were powerful armies and kings. But I ask you, where are they today? And where are these kingdoms of the past today? Where are they? When you think of Rome in the time of Jesus... The powerful army of Rome and the powerful emperors. Where is that empire today? It doesn't exist. They're simply memories of human history. The civilizations of the past with their buildings having suffered under the elements of time and weather. What these empires could not do was sustain themselves. They had power for a moment, but not forever. It is interesting that the gamma ray burst lasts a few seconds and the strong nuclear force is limited by its, its size or it's just a very small area. What is sustainable, what lasts, is powerful. What is eternal is powerful. The classic John verse, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. They will not perish. You see, the greatest force, the most powerful event, is the life that God gives, and he gives life. The angel said to Mary, the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of the Lord forever. His kingdom will never end. 
In John, again, John chapter 5 says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my words and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He is crossed over from death to life. Now this, now this is power. God wants people to know this life and to know this power and this life is to know his love. He loves you and he loves people and he gives them life. It is love that God wants people to enjoy in the life that he gives. In 1 John 4, we're told that God is love. We're told that he loved us first, that he sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins to get rid of our sins. He did this because he loves you and me. He loves us even though we're unlovable. His life is his love. The life we live because of God is the love that he has for you and me. I would dare say the greatest force in the universe of God is God's love. For his love is what gives you life when there is only death and it's life everlasting. It never ends. So let me ask you, is there any force in the universe that gives life or brings to life that which is dead? God does. God's love is stronger than any force, than any kingdom, than any exploding star, than any idea, than any army and any weapon. God's love lasts. What is here momentarily, God's love lasts forever. What seems invincible today is forgotten tomorrow. What is powerful today lies in ruins tomorrow. But God's love never dies and never ends. In Daniel 2, Daniel tells a vision that King Nebuchadnezzar had, and, and, and he, he interpreted it. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar had this, this vision of this statue made up of different materials, gold, silver, uh, things like that. And so he tells him and he interprets the vision. This is, what he, this is what he says. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. This is the kingdoms of man, this picture of this statue that is ultimately destroyed by the kingdom of God. And what we see is that God's kingdom will not be controlled by man, is not created by man, is not defeated by man, and 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 that God's kingdom never ends. The reason this is true is that God's kingdom is God's revelation of his love for us. And the kingdoms that we build are a revelation of our selfishness. And selfishness doesn't last. But God's love lasts. God's love lasts forever. And God's love is more powerful than anything in the universe. And greater than any kingdom that would ever be built by man. So I challenge us today. Let us live in God's love. Let us live in God's love. Live in his love and know the power of God. Live in his love and know the life he gives. Live in his love and invite others into his presence. Live in his love and forgive. Live in his love and serve, give, pray, obey, and proclaim. Live in his love. Know it, enjoy it, celebrate his love. Offer others to come in and know his love. Number one, his love cannot be stopped. His love cannot be stopped. Let's look at Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future nor any power, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In the Old Testament, the nation of Israel had a saying they would use in worship. It was a common saying. I've, I've seen it as I've, re- I've been reading through the Old Testament. I, I see this phrase come out quite a bit. They would put it to music, and it reminded them of who God is and, and who he continues to be. Uh, it put, this phrase would put them in their place as it would exalt God, putting him in his rightful place. It was a simple phrase, but it was a powerful statement of who God is. And when, when David brought the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, he wrote a psalm and he gave it to Asaph. And Asaph was the, given the role of worship leader. 
And in that psalm, he uses that phrase. First Chronicles says, give thanks to the Lord for his for he is good. His love endures forever. When Solomon dedicated the temple that he built, the worship leaders raised their voice and praised the Lord and saying, he is good. His love endures forever. When King Jehoshaphat heard that a vast army was coming to attack him. And they were coming to attack him. And, he, and, and what does he do? He becomes afraid. And he prays to God. And God says, this battle is mine, not yours. And who does he put in the very front of his, his army? He puts worshipers. And his worshipers saying, give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. This is repeated in Jeremiah when God, prophet, when God tells the prophet that this city of Jerusalem lies desolate now, but it will be filled one day with voices singing this phrase, the Lord is good, his love endures forever. It's repeated in Ezra when the exiles returned and laid the foundation of the temple. And, and Psalm 136 is dedicated to the phrase, his love endures forever. What this says and what this means is that his love cannot be stopped His love is what is driving his people to worship him. It is his love that God is revealing himself to them, bringing them to the peace that they need. They recognize that all that God did was an expression of his love and his love cannot be stopped. In the hymn, The Love of God, it has been said that this verse of the hymn was found on the wall of a patient's room in an insane asylum. And this is the verse that was found. Could we with ink the ocean fill and were the skies of parchment made where every stock on earth a quill and every man a scribe by trade to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry nor could the scroll contain the whole though stretched from sky to sky. What we find is that the kingdom fall that is that kingdoms fall inventions die ideas decay but God's love endures. As certain as the sun rises in the morning and sets in the evening, God's love is more lasting and more enduring. All one day, all this will go away. All this will be burned up. All this will be gone. But God's love endures. That is what makes it real and true. No amount of struggle, no amount of tribulation or difficulty can stop God's love. His love endures forever. So let us live in that love. First observation, God's love is truth. Paul wrote Romans in in the book of Romans. He wrote this letter uh, to the church in Rome, um, telling them about the gospel that he's been preaching all over the Gentile world. And it was reported that he was creating some sort of new message that wasn't from the Hebrew Bible. And so he clearly spelled out that what he was teaching Uh, showing them from the Hebrew scriptures that what he was saying about Christ was always there, that he wasn't teaching anything new. Everything that he said could be found in in scripture. It was spelled out in God's plan. Christ, he would say, is the fulfillment of God's heart. Christ is the reason. And he's all throughout the Old Testament. He's all throughout the Hebrew Bible. There is Christ. And he would point it out very clearly. In fact, Christ is the fullest expression of God's love and the reason that God's love endures forever for Christ endures forever. Well, in Romans, Paul makes the argument that the righteousness of God has always been given and received through faith. Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteousness to right given to him. So we come to God in faith and he gives us his righteousness. Sin is defeated through faith. And now we have faith in Christ. And it is his righteousness that he gives. Now, in Christ, when you put your faith in Christ, you receive his righteousness. And I believe as he's writing this and he's talking about this gospel and he's presenting it in this format and drawing from the Old Testament, all these scriptures and prophecies. He comes to Romans 8 and says, this is the fulfillment of what righteousness looks like is in Romans 8. It captures the very goal and fulfillment of all that God wants to do in you and through you. And it is the reality what God is doing in the heart of the church as well. He has made his church righteous. And as a result, he's made them heirs of God and co-heirs of Christ. He has removed their fear and giving them the spirit of sonship. Consequently, as a church, we cry out, Abba, Father, we call God Daddy. We know him intimately and deeply. We know him as Christ knows him. If we are the child of God, viewed and seen as Christ, his love cannot and will not fail. 
If it cannot fail, it is the truth. What lasts is the truth. Jesus said, heaven and earth will will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Why won't they pass away? Because they're truth. Truth lasts. Truth endures. Truth cannot be stopped. God's love is truth. And what that means is that when you live in his love, you live in truth. So when Paul sums up his argument in Romans 8, he uses this word here in verse uh, uh, 838, for I am convinced. He is convinced. He uses the word convinced, meaning it is certain. It is the truth that his love cannot be stopped. He is convinced that nothing can separate us from the love of God. No amount of energy, no amount of effort, no amount of power, no amount of struggle, no amount of tribulation, no amount of attacks, no amount of anything can separate you from the love of God. There is no power in the universe that can stop or undo what God has said he's going to do. And it says, hey, I'm going to love you. You know, when you live in God's love, you're living in God's power. And that means you're engaging the enemy and defeating his strongholds when you love and you live in his love. You are conquering the enemy by loving each other and loving God. You are exposing his lies when you love and you are overcoming overcoming his fiery darts. You see, the enemy wants us to fight each other. The enemy wants to hurt us to hurt each other, to become divisive and make each other an enemy. But when we live in love, we recognize who the real enemy is and fight him. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 6. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That is our enemy. Paul wrote in Colossians, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You see, if God's love cannot be stopped and nothing can separate us from the love of God, then let us love. Let us love when people hate us. Let us love when we face injustice. Let us love when people attack, when we are mocked, when we're insulted, when we're persecuted. Let us love because his love cannot be stopped. His love cannot be conquered. And persecution cannot stop his love. We can love because we are attacking the enemy, the true enemy, and defeating his strongholds. Now, let me tell you, this is an impossible thing to do, to love on your own the way God is calling us to love. Because we will run out of love. Jesus loved while he was taken to the cross, while he was spat on and beaten with whips. He loved when his hands and feet were nailed and people laughed at his apparent defeat. He loved because he knew God's love endures forever. So live in his love. Second observation, God's love cannot be contained. You know, the furthest galaxy discovered by... um, spectroscopy, I guess that's how you say it, is called Z8GND5296.6. And no, that's not an AOL, old AOL, you know, email thing. It's a galaxy that is said to be 13.8 billion light years away. Spatially speaking, that means that is the, as far as we know, that's the highest height. It's the farthest we've seen. The deepest depth is uh, this trench under Guam. We've heard a lot of Gu- about Guam this week. And there's a trench underneath the Guam that's almost seven miles deep. From zero gravity to the thousand times atm- atmospheric pressure of the deep seas, God's love is present and accounted for. If you could, if you could travel 13.8 billion miles away, light years away, you would never escape his love, even if you went 13.9. And if you went seven miles down into the earth, you cannot escape his love. His love goes beyond the borders of space and time. You, can't even, you cannot escape his love, even if you could escape time and space. His love is that great. 
Now, let's look at some of these words that Paul uses here in 838 and 39. He says, death, life, angels, demons, present, future, any powers, height, depth, anything else and anything else in all creation. That's quite a list. Now, Paul is using every extreme and every boundary that he can think of. Notice he didn't use the word persecution because persecution is not an extreme boundary in his eyes. There's something beyond even that. And I think at times we modify this list. I think we change this list. And we contain God's love and say, God loves me. And then we create a list. Okay. And we say, if I lose my job or my car breaks down or the economy goes sour, I become sick or a certain politician didn't win an election or I didn't get to be first string. Then God's love is not, God doesn't love me anymore. And we create this list and we put God and say, only God loves me if these things happen to me. And so we put God in this small box that if all these good things happen to me, then God's love is true. But when we match it up with Paul's list, we see that no matter what happens, no matter if your relationships break down, if you lose everything, God's love is still there. If you lose everything, he will walk you through. He will carry you through. His love will not stop. His love cannot be defeated by your circumstances. And so when Paul puts this list together, he says, let's look at this list. Let's say we go all the way to these extremes. Do you think God's love is defeated by that extreme? No. It doesn't even scratch the surface. God's love is even greater than that. If you lost everything, if this whole world right now rose up and said, we don't like you. God's love would still be there. So let us live in his love. Number two, his love does not fail. His love does not fail. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 13. Notice says the love chapter. Let's look at verse, start with verse one. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. His love does not fail. A group of children were once asked, uh, what does love mean? And here are some of their answers. Rebecca 8 said, when my grandmother got arthritis, she couldn't bend over and paint her toenails anymore. So my grandfather does it for the, her all the time, even when his hands got arthritis too. That's love. Uh, Billy said, when someone loves you the way they say your name is different, you just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Bobby 7 says, love is what's in the room at Christmas time if you stop opening presents and listen. I like that one. Nika 6 says, if you want to learn to love better, you should start with someone you hate. Wow, pretty good wisdom. Tommy 6 says, love is like a little old woman and a little old man who are still friends even after they know each other so well. Cindy 8 says, during my piano recital, I was on a stage and I was scared. I looked at all the people watching me and I saw my daddy waving and smiling. He was the only one doing that and I wasn't scared anymore. And then Jessica 8 says, you really shouldn't say I love you unless you mean it. But if you mean it, you should say it a lot. You know, when I look at that list of what these kids are saying as they're defining love, it notice it tends to the small things. It's not the big things. He's tending to what we would think is insignificant. And yet it's a big demonstration of what love is. And when I see and hear that God is love and what it means that God is love, I see that God is deeply involved, even with this, what we would say is the insignificant things in our lives. He's aware of who we are, even at the tiniest level. 
He's involved with our lives. He's near us as he calls us to be near him. I hear of God's involvement of, uh, in our lives as I read this chapter in 1 Corinthians 13. Number one, God's love is the more excellent way. Is the more excellent way. In fact, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 31 actually says it, and I will show you the most excellent way. And then he talks about love. You know, as Paul's writing to the Corinthians, he talks to the church about spiritual gifts and he corrects some of their poor thinking. And he speaks to the motivation of the gifts. Why are you doing these gifts? And, and he's really talking also about the, what is driving you to do these gifts? What are your motivations? Mm-hmm. And he's more concerned that they're united than, uh, with each other than they are about individual effort. Okay. Now, in the midst of this discussion, he wants to see what is behind the gifts and what powers the spiritual gifts. And to him and to, uh, you know, to God, it's love. Love is the most excellent way. It's the way in which people of God are to act toward each other. The gift itself is worthless without love. And he says that he starts out with that in the first part of 13. They're worthless. The gift without love does nobody any good. That is why he gives these examples in these first three verses. He says, if I speak in tongues, if I can prophesy, if I have faith, if I give all that I have, or if I willingly die for Christ, but I have love, I do not have love, then what have I accomplished? Absolutely nothing. Because you wonder if I'm dying for Christ, as I'm going to the flames or to the, the lion's den or whatever, I'm dying for Christ. What's really driving me? And that's what he's saying. If I if you are speaking in tongues of angels and men and have not love, you're making a lot of noise. And if you give all your money to the poor, to the church or missions and you have not love. It's nothing. And he didn't say it's like, well, that's like 50 percent or, you know, that's only three quarters. No, he says nothing. Transformation didn't take place. Lives were not changed and Christ was not exalted. Nothing was ever accomplished if it was not done in love. Paul did not want his people to pursue gifts as much as he wanted them to pursue love. It is love that is power and it's love that endures. And when Paul gives these examples of using gifts without love, he's saying those sacrifices and those gifts do not endure. What makes anything endure is love. Now, look at this list Paul uses as he defines love in 4 through 8. Patient, kind, does not envy, does not boast, is not proud, it is not rude, it is not self-seeking, is not easily angered, angered, it keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. These are powerful words. And when you look at this, you realize I'm reading about who God is. This is the character and nature of who God is. This is how he treats you and me. If this is how he treats you and me, this is how we should treat each other. You know, he is patient. He's kind. He does not envy. What would he want anything from us anyway, other than our love? (laughs) He does not boast. He's not proud. In fact, he defined humility with Christ on the cross. He's not rude. He's not self-seeking. He's not easily angered. Thankfully for that. Could you imagine if he was easily angered? I think we'd have a, a lifespan of two years old. He keeps no record of wrong. We see that in Psalm. As far as the east is from the west, so far as I removed your sins from me. They're gone. He celebrates with the truth. He does not delight in evil. He does not give up. You know, he celebrates you. He rejoices over the good things in your life. He rejoices over that. He celebrates over that. Love never fails. God never fails because his love endures forever. He is asking you to love like this. He's calling you to love like this because love never fails. You know, when you look at the, this list, let's say, you know, you start out, love is patient, love is kind. Let's try those two. Okay, let's be patient and kind. (laughs) Well, if you run with me to Matthew 5, uh, 43, this is sort of his patience and kindness. Well, really his love examined. 
5.43 says of Matthew, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are you not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brother, what are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. And you look at that and go, the love that God is asking me to do is love that is way out of my league. Okay, it's way out of my league. There's no way I will accomplish this. I, I, I've already admitted defeat. I'm done. I, I, I can't do it. I, I look at this list of, of how he loves us. And people who come against him constantly and are violent toward him and hostile toward him. And he, yet he still loves them. This is way out of my league. It's way beyond what I can even imagine. It is the very nature of God. So I be- guess what I better do? I better cling to Christ if I'm going to love like this. I better draw everything I have on Christ if I'm going to love like this. I better rely on him. I better cling to him. I better hold on to him. I better draw from him. I better submit to him if this love is going to flow through me. If we believe that love never fails, then let us do that. Let us cling to him like we've never done and hold on to him so that we can live in God's love. Number three, his love brings us to maturity. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 13. We'll start with verse 8 again. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Now we see, but a poor reflection is in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Love is maturity. Love is the goal. The end is love and the fulfillment of God's heart is love. As Paul continues to write about love, he returns to the issue of these, these gifts and he says his argument is, is really the same as the worshipers in the Old Testament. Give thanks to the Lord for his love endures forever. Love endures. The gifts come and go, but love never ends. Number one, pursue loving others. You know, the argument Paul is making is for the Corinthian church to love and to pursue loving others. He's almost saying, don't even worry about the gifts. Just love each other and then the gifts will come. If you make love primary, don't worry, the gifts will flow. Love is our priority. Love is our goal. Love is our calling. Love is our future. Love is to be our prayer. Make this chapter your prayer. Make this chapter your prayer. When you do, expect the enemy to fight you, harass you, attack you. I guarantee you, you start loving like this, you will be attacked because this is open warfare for the enemy. So let this be our prayer. Since Christ has so loved me, may I simply act in the manner that he's treated me. As Paul talks about love, he talks about when he was a child. What he's saying is that to live in a childish state is to not love. But to mature and to get out of childhood, we have to love. And I put childish things behind me, meaning I now love. I pursue love. I will give love. I will, be the, I will let God flow through me his love. And I will love. A lot of times we hold on to things. We hold on to them. And it keeps us from maturing. So let us live in God's love. Now, second observation, motivation. You know, as Paul speaks to the Corinthian church, he's saying instead of focusing simply on what the gifts, focus on something deeper that will give life to the spiritual gifts, that will cause transformation and healing and blessing. Let us love. You know, people used what God gave, that, what God gave them to promote themselves, and that was the problem. The spiritual gifts became a motivation of, look how good I am. Look at me. Our, everything, our significance is wrapped up in our love for each other. And our love from God. You know, when Christ walked this earth, he pointed people to his father. 
in order to love as this chapter calls us to love is that we have to get rid of ourselves as we sing that first song i believe we have to get rid of ourselves as the john the baptist says he must increase i must decrease we have to get rid of trying to show people who we are and let Christ have all of us and say, Lord, you show me. I want, to, I want to focus on you. I want to boast in you. I want to exalt you. I want all of Christ in me and, and, and none of me. I want to get out of the way. We want to boast in Christ, not in ourselves. That is the essence of love. We love Christ so much that we can't help but talk about him. We love each other that we serve each other. We love the lost that we bring them to Christ so they can know the lo- know Christ. The motivation of Christ was, was to submit to the Father since he loved the Father. What is our motivation? Now, that is a tough question, a difficult question, because it will reveal what we're trying to pursue. And I think it's a question we have to ask. What, it, what is motivating me today? As Paul closes this chapter, he talked about knowing in part and then knowing fully. You see, when Christ returns, we will fully know. But love will never end. It will continue on in the relationship. It will continually grow in you and me. It will continually mature in you and me. It will endure forever. Because God's love endures forever. So let us live in his love. Let's pray. Father God, I look at this amazing word love and what you have done in describing love, in showing and demonstrating your love. And it's overwhelming. It's, it's, there's no words that can capture the greatness of your love. And so, Lord, I pray that today, that in these people here today, your servants, your children, if they're struggling, maybe we forgot about your love. Sometimes we don't feel the love. I pray, Lord, we would look at your word and recognize your love is true. And so, Lord, I pray that you would comfort each person here today. You would comfort their hearts. You would comfort their minds with your love. That, Lord, we would hold this deep in our hearts and minds and recognize your amazing love. In Jesus' name.